A typical adult's daily resting metabolism requires about 1300 to 1600 calories, but this cost varies widely, largely because of variations in fat-free body mass. More muscular bodies consume more energy at rest. The remainder of your energy budget is spent doing things like physical activity, digesting, and keeping your body temperature stable. So for example, if you lie in bed all day, you can maintain your energy balance by ingesting just a fraction more than your resting metabolic demands. But if you decide to run a marathon, you'll need an additional two to 3,000 calories. Food contains energy stored in the chemical bonds between its molecules. The basic components of food are the macronutrients, proteins, carbohydrates, and fats. Protein is primarily used for building and maintaining tissues and is broken down for fuel relatively rarely. In contrast, carbohydrates and fats are stored and burned for energy, but in different ways. The key difference to remember is that carbohydrates are much easier and quicker to burn than fats, but they store energy less densely. A gram of sugar contains four calories of energy, but a gram of fat has nine calories. This is why your body mainly relies on fat as a way to store energy in reserve. In comparison, it stores very little as carbohydrate in the form of glycogen. Now that we have reviewed the basics of how you store fats and carbohydrates as energy, what does that mean in the context of fueling your run? From the moment you start running, your muscles and other tissues consume more energy. This results in a drop in your blood glucose levels, causing the secretion of several hormones whose job it is to release stored energy. One of those hormones, glucagon, is also produced by the pancreas, but has the reverse effect of insulin on the liver causing it to transform both glycogen and fats into sugar. Another key hormone, cortisol, is produced by the adrenal glands, which sit atop the kidneys. Cortisol has many effects, but the main ones we're interested in here include blocking the action of insulin, stimulating muscle cells to burn glycogen, and causing fat and muscle cells to release triglycerides into the bloodstream. Humans have adapted over hundreds of thousand years to be physically active even during long periods of negative energy balance. Our ancestors would have frequently needed to hunt and gather on an empty stomach. In fact, when glycogen levels in the liver fall too much, your body automatically switches to burning mostly fat, and if needed, some protein, to keep feeding your brain, which has no energy stores of its own. But over an intense period of activity, when you need energy quickly, your body will have a preference focusing on carbs first and then fats. Early experiments in the first half of the 20th century showed that the balance between fat and carbohydrate use depends on how hard you're working. During easy exercise, like a gentle walk, you burn mostly fat from the supplies circulating in your bloodstream. As you speed up, carbohydrates are used to an increasing extent. By the time you're breathing heavily, the proportions have flipped and you're burning mostly carbohydrate. The precise blend depends on a variety of factors. The fitter you are, for example, the greater the proportion of fat you burn at any given speed, simply because maintaining a given speed gets easier as you get fitter. No matter how fit you are, you'll burn the same fat-carb mix at any given relative intensity. Eating a diet high in either fat or carbohydrate also tilts your preferred fuel mix in that direction. But even taking these factors into account, carbohydrates dominate for any intense exercise. One study found that over the marathon distance, running at a 2 hour 45 pace relied on 97% carbohydrate fuel, while slowing down to 3 hours 45 minute pace reduced the carbohydrate reliance to 68%. As we've discussed, the sources of those carbohydrates mainly include your liver, which can store between 400 and 500 calories of glycogen for use throughout the body, and your leg muscles, which can store about 2000 calories. That's why it's useful to eat a small breakfast a few hours before a morning marathon. Provided you have maintained your energy balance over the days leading up to the race, your glycogen stores in your muscles will be fully stocked, but your liver glycogen gets depleted because it fuels your energy hungry brain while you sleep. So you need to top that back up right before your race. As you run, your muscles can also dip into the glucose circulating in your blood, though this is only a very small amount. The upshot is that a well-prepared athlete might be able to store 2,500 calories of carbohydrate. Running a marathon though, for a runner weighing just under 70 kilos or 11 stone, takes around 3,000 calories, most of which will come from carbohydrate if you're racing as fast as you can. Harking back to the 
human body is a machine view we talked about before then, that means you either need to refuel your carbohydrate stores along the route or risk the well-known but dreaded phenomenon of hitting the wall. Defining the wall is difficult from a physiological perspective. There is no single biomarker that reliably reflects the subjective experience of generalized fatigue, unintentionally slowing pace, desire to walk, and shifting focus to survival, which were reported by runners in a recently published survey. But in any case, in the avoidance of hitting the wall, it makes sense for endurance athletes to stock up on carbohydrates as much as possible. And that more or less is what sports scientists and sports nutritionists have been advocating since the 1970s. Keep your glycogen levels high by consuming a diet that gets 60 to 65% of its calories from carbohydrates. Top up your stores by carb loading in the final few days before a competition. And in events lasting longer than about 90 minutes, eat or drink some easily digested carbohydrates to supplement your stored glycogen, which will otherwise run out. Empirically speaking, this advice seems to work quite well. One study found that Kenyan runners who currently hold 60 of the top 100 men's marathon times in history typically get 76.5% of their calories from carbohydrate, including 23% from ugali, a sticky and stomach-filling cornmeal mash, and 20% from the spoonfuls of sugar they heap into their tea and porridge. Another 35 times on the top 100 list are held by Ethiopians. A similar study found that they get 64.3% of their calories from carbohydrate, with the biggest contribution from injera, a sourdough flatbread made from a local grain called teff. This reliance on carbs is also reflected in the in-race nutrition plans of the elites. Haley Gerbrusselassi, when he set a world record of 2 hours 4 minutes and 26 seconds at the Berlin Marathon in 2007, drank about 2 litres of fluid during the race. Of these 2 litres, 1.25 litres was a sugar-sweetened sports drink and the rest was plain water. And he also took 5 sports gels, providing a total of between 60 and 80 grams of carbohydrate per hour. That number is significant because scientists have traditionally figured that 60 grams an hour, about 250 calories, is pretty much the maximum you can absorb during exercise. The rate limiting step is the amount of carbohydrate absorption from the intestine into the bloodstream. But Gebri Selassie was taking advantage of newly published data at the time, showing that if you combine two different types of carbohydrate, glucose and fructose, for example, they pass through the intestinal wall using two different cellular routes that can operate simultaneously, enabling you to absorb as much as 90 grams of carbohydrate per hour. Taking on that much carbohydrate in the middle of a race is not easy. You have to train your tummy to do it, but it does improve performance based on the 2014 study which showed that runners who took on regular carbohydrate gels during a marathon ran nearly 5% faster overall than those they were paired with based on ability who did not. In theory, the math behind this sort of fueling plan is simple. The number of calories you need to ingest is the difference between how many you already have stored in your body and how many you want to burn. In practice though, the body's workings turn out to be considerably more complicated. Researchers have recently shown that glycogen stores in your muscles don't just act as energy reservoirs, they also help individual muscle fibres contract efficiently. That means your muscles will weaken as you burn through your glycogen stores. Those muscles will also preferentially burn their stores of glycogen before turning to glucose from your bloodstream. The practical result of which, no matter how quickly you shuttle glucose into your bloodstream through energy gels or sports drinks, you won't be able to stave off fatigue indefinitely. In short, the limits of human performance in long distance running events like the marathon cannot solely be attributed to fuel availability. As we've already discussed, fatigue is multifactorial, so too are the limits of human performance.